All right, Mark. Thank you. Hey, can you ready? All right. I don't know how I'm going to follow that. <laughs> but um, I'm going to make this a little more conversational. I think, for all intents and purposes, we have all had quite a bit to chew on today. So, I, And I'm not capable of teaching you anything new or anything uh, that would be worth chewing over. So I'm going to talk about my journey, uh, coming to the realization and the understanding uh, of these doctrines that we, you know, we, we hold so dear. I use, I reference a, a verse that I used earlier in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, where it says, For the era will be uh, when they will not tolerate sound teaching, but their hearing being tickled, they will heap up for themselves teachers in accord with their own desires, and indeed they will be turning their hearing away from the truth, yet will be turned aside to myths. Now in the context of this verse, I, I really don't think that, that Paul is meaning that everyone out there that is teaching contrary doctrine is doing with, with malice and a yeah. forethought, and, that, yeah. and boy, I'm going I'm to fool these people, yeah. I'm going to teach them, yeah. uh, you know, spread a load of manure in them, and they're going to love it. Uh -huh. uh, it. That's not the way it is. As right. Some do, for profit and gain or whatever, but most don't. Most are sincere in what they teach. Yeah. And I was brought up, raised in a large, a relatively large church in, in Altoona, Pennsylvania. The pastor was fairly well known in, 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 as like said, in the circles that we ran in several years ago. And raised in that church, and that was a hellfire and brimstone church. You know, uh, if you don't trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to die and you're going to drop into hell. And, and I remember the preacher many times getting up and, and, and castigating people who saw, taught something contrary to what he taught. And, you know, that doctrine is from the pit of hell. Okay? And get the, those words and those phrases and those terms that get people all worked up and all emotional and, and, and everything. You didn't have to do any of that to get people emotional about and excited about what you were talking about. That is mind-blowing. <laughs> Absolutely mind-blowing. Did I say it's mind-blowing? To think the things that God has in store for His sons. Yeah. So I grew up in this church. At about age, I don't know what it was, 18, 19, 20, I left. I went to college, got a degree. I taught school for a year. I taught school in a little town called Winber, where, where Clyde is residing now and has for several years. I taught there for one year, and after that year, I went into the military. And in the military, we moved around quite a bit, and everywhere we went to, we were looking for a, quote, grace church, because that's what I had been taught. That's what I had known. And so, in, in doing so, uh, we could never find anybody who just really understood what we understood. Now, at that time, I thought I knew something. <laughs> I, I thought I really knew a lot of what the Word of God said. And, I, and you know, I, I, had, I had pretty well down pat of, you know, the details and some of the things you filled in, I didn't know. But for all intents and purposes, I knew what God was doing and, and, and how He was doing it and, and so on and so forth. And so we had this continuous search looking for these churches that taught, uh, uh, that, that held the Pauline epistles as, as superior for today, and Paul is our apostle, and you would talk to people, and, and, and it came to the point where we finally had to just uh, compromise and say, well, this is the best of what we have or can find, so this is where we'll go. And I remember very clearly going into a Baptist church in Pensacola, Florida. <coughs> Wonderful people, lovely people. Kind, gracious. I mean, it would do anything for you. But, as was my teaching, uh, or my learning, uh, I hadn't been water baptized, and I didn't believe in water baptism at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, we would go into the church, and we would become, uh, in, you know, uh, attend the services, but we couldn't become a member because we weren't baptized. 
So every Sunday morning, and this happened for six, seven months, every Sunday morning we would be in there, and all right, all you members, stand up and have the greeting song, you know. There's a welcome here, there's a welcome, you know, and we'd be sitting down all the time, and people would go, why don't you become a member? Why don't you get water baptized so you can become a member? And, and that's what we went through. And I, we did this all through the through my time in, in the military whenever we were stateside in that. And so we, we kept looking and looking and looking for this. And so finally, at one point, uh, we uh, threw, uh, I got out of the military and I went back uh, as a, uh, I, I went to Pensacola three times, Pensacola area three times. First as a student, secondly as an instructor, and third as a civilian instructor. So I, I spent the better part of 10 years in Pensacola, the Pensacola, Florida area. And so we went back the third time as a, I was a civilian uh, instructor, and we found a group of grace believers. And I'm not saying names, but I have come to realize that the fellow who led, led it was just downright nasty. A downright nasty man. He would get up and he would pound the pulpit and he'd go out and he'd look at you right in the eye and say, don't you realize you're not worth the gunpowder take to blow you into hell? Nice. Whoa. That was his attitude. And he was... That's could, could I interject yes. something just for, yeah. the, for the sake of context for our, our uh, folks here who's not familiar? You keep saying a, a grace uh, a church or whatever. So called. Uh, the the, the uh, denomination that we both pastored in, uh, they called themselves the grace movement. And, and they focused on Paul and saw that he was a distinct apostle. Um, but they didn't understand the salvation of all. They believed in hell uh, mm. and so forth. So uh, just, just to help you have the background of, you know, so he's explaining to you. Here's someone who, who, who professes to believe that Paul's distinct and Paul's the apostle and yet preaching hellfire and damnation and yeah. heart. So just a little comment. And I won't speak long because I know the more important speakers come afterwards than that. So this is, this is where I got into. And it got to the point, and maybe some of you can relate to this. It got to the point where he would, he would preach out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And his favorite term for a while there was the term lost believers. Unless you have believed in vain, in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, verse uh, what is it, 2, I, I don't know. If you want to look it up, 1 Corinthians 15. And he would preach lost believers. And for a while there, was over and over, every week, every message. And at one point in his life, for a number of years, he was what we'd call a modern-day circuit preacher. Monday, he would go to some place in Alabama and teach a class. Tuesday, he would go somewhere up in northern Alabama and teach a class. Wednesday, he'd come over somewhere over in Louisiana, uh, in Mississippi, wh wherever, in Florida. And he would do this circuit over and over and over again. So one night, we were um, uh, going to Mobile, Alabama. <clears throat> he was teaching a class over there. And we're there, and he'd been, he'd been on this lost believers, and lost believers. And I know a lot of you can relate to this, because you go, maybe you go to a new church, you move somewhere, and you're looking for a place to assemble, a place to, to fellowship, and you get in there, and you're under suspicion right away, because you weren't saved under their ministry. Therefore, you may not be saved. So our job is to get you lost, to get you saved again, to, to, to make it sure, okay? And so we went over there, and he's harping on this and harping on this, and I'm beginning to wonder if I'm saved. And so finishes the class, and I'm just under this horrendous conviction. I mean, it, it was, what it was, was terrorism. Mm -hmm. Mental terrorism, emotional terrorism, spiritual terror. spiritual terror. It was terrorism. And so we're riding back on, on, on in the van. It was about a big van. Uh, must have been 10, 12 people there. And it's just as quiet as can be. And, oh, it's just under conviction and under conviction. I just, oh, it's terrible. 
and I got off the van, and I got in my car, and this is about a 1 o'clock in the morning in Pensacola, Florida. Well, Pensacola, Florida, bigger now than it was then. But at that time, it was a fairly good-sized city, but it's not like Chicago or L.A. At 1 in the morning, the streets are generally empty. And I'm driving home my car. Now, I didn't live in Pensacola. I lived in a little town called Milton, Florida, north of Pensacola. And it's about a 40-minute drive from where I was at up north. And I come to this intersection. And I'm telling you, this is, is as clear as it happened to me yesterday. I come to this intersection, and the, and the lights are blinking, and I know. I know if I drive through that intersection with the blinking light, that there's going to be a cement truck loaded with cement coming down from the other, inter the other road, and he's not going to stop, and he's going to go straight through that intersection and hit my car and kill me. And where am I going to spend eternity? And so this is the thoughts. I'm not telling you what really happened. I'm telling you what really th I thought happened. I'm under conviction. I'm terrified. And so I, I, how many times do you, dear Lord Jesus, yeah. I know I'm a sinner. Yeah. I know you died on the cross. For, I believe you died for me. I believe you I saved me from hell. How many times have you ever gone through that? Because you, okay. And then when you're done, would I really believe? Did, did I really believe? Or, or, or was it just some emotional response that I had? This is terror. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I went through this. And I couldn't be sure of my salvation. And it's working on me. And it's working on my wife. And my sons don't understand. They can't figure out what's wrong with dad. And they, so, were, they were with you in the car? No, they weren't. Oh, okay. Fortunately, they were not. Gotcha. And my wife wasn't, but uh, I don't know. I'm going to remember she was not. But nevertheless, my boys were not. Okay? And so I'm just, I'm, and it's, it's weighing on me and weighing on me. And the terror of eternal damnation in a torture chamber of fire and, 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 and never getting out of it. Did I do it right? Did I believe right? Did I believe hard? Did I, did I work up the faith enough to make it stick? Yeah. And so, over and over. And this was weighing on me for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I went to another conference. And I said, I, I, I said to a, a really wonderful gentleman, just a beautiful man. He's just a, a kind, a compassionate, considerate man. I said, I don't... I don't know if I'm saved. I don't feel like I'm saved. Well, did you believe? Hmm? Yeah. Well, then you must be sick. But I don't feel saved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it happened over and over. And it, I never got a satisfactory conclusion to that because eventually it just kind of faded away. Mm -hmm. You know? And then I, I, I was able to sit back or stand back and get a little perspective on the whole thing and realize that whole thing was a sham. Mm. That, that whole thing was just a sham. Mm. And so a little later I started teaching. I, I said, I'm saved. I know what I'm saved. I know what I believe. And so I started teaching and doing a little preaching in that. And the problem is, I didn't know about this stuff, universal reconciliation, until about 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, there's a juxtaposition in my life. And, and I'm, I'm trying to remember this. And I don't even remember all the factors that led to this, but it was a, a time of crisis in my life. I began to read some of this, this, these things. I began to go, <laughs> wow. <laughs> This is really cool. This is neat. And I'm starting to think about retirement then. I've been retired for a year and a half. Uh, I'm starting to think about retirement then. And a lot of things happening in my life that I can't tell you now because they're, they're, they're personal. But they were happening in my life. And they all came together for this crisis period in my life. And lo and behold, God showed me writings by this man I'm going wow I never heard this before 
this is the greatest thing I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> not, not just his writing, but the, the doctrine of universal reconciliation. Mm -hmm. That hell is a mistranslation. It, there's no place where God is going to stick people and torment them for forever and ever. And I got to learn more and more, and I'm, you know, constantly trying to learn more and more. Uh, as I'm getting older, it's a little harder, but I'm learning more and more. And you know what? When you you come into a teaching like this, when you come into a, a a just rock bottom solid truth like this, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to tell somebody, all right, boy, when I tell them this, they're going to really go nuts. Oh, man, they're going to love this. So I had a little assembly I taught once a month up in Erie. I had a little home church that we had. And so I went, to, I go to Erie and a group of believers up there, grace believers in this area, in this fellowship, loosely, and I began to interject and introduce just little bits of that, or you'd ask a certain question, a certain way to try to get them to think, and after a while, they begin to catch on. Um, Mark, we don't want you to come back anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. If you don't want me, that's fine. As long I was as I was parroting the belief, the doctrines that the leader of the overall leader of that group, you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The overall leader, as long as I parroted those doctrines, I was okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But once I started questioning some of those things. And I remember sitting in an assembly in a large city in the Midwest and having this preacher get up and say, the Bible is 100% God and 100% man. Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. Salvation is 100% God and 100% man. And what did we all do in the in, we were sitting there? Uh-huh. 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 No discernment. No understanding. No, hey, wait a minute. This doesn't sound right. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so that's that's where, where I was at. So I came to this point and I had another group in, in our own home. And a, you know, a wonderful family, and it's an extended family. Uh, the, some of the hardest working people I've ever met in my life. You talk about solid, bedrock, or down to the earth people that you could count on. That's this family, an extended family. I still love them. They're just, they're just wonderful. But we had them in our, 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 our uh, living room. We'd have a, a little assembly, and we'd a little bit of teaching in that. And I started teaching on, well, maybe the King James is not quite exactly right in everywhere, uh, everywhere it says. Oh, no. Mm. Oh, wrong thing to say. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and bringing up the subject of hell. They have been indoctrinated <clears throat> like I have been indoctrinated. Not to look at the scripture. Not to think and look at it and say, wait a minute, this says this and this says that. Mm -hmm. And look at words and study the meanings of words and things such as this. I have been indoctrinated not to. As long as I parroted what I was taught and what was taught, I was fine. Mm -hmm. But once you go outside that, okay, If you taught that same stuff that you taught today up in that group in Erie, they would probably run out the doors pulling their hair like the Pharisees did. And she, gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth. They couldn't take it. All right? But that's what I was, had been indoctrinated in. I had, I had a man uh, 
my daughter and her and her husband go to a, a, an assembly there. It's a Baptist church in the area, and uh, I had mentioned to her, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about a place called hell. And so my daughter told her pastor, and so her pastor wrote back, Jesus talks about hell in the Bible more than any other. Oh my goodness! All right. Well, first of all. <laughs> I don't think Jesus spoke English. <laughs> so let's find out the word that he did use and see if it... That, but that... I told you before. I've tried it uh, with my extended family. They'd say something. They, they'd post something on a Facebook thing. And, and <clears throat> well, you know, maybe you want to consider this and that. And so now I have become... The, as I said, the strange uncle. He's funny, has funny beliefs. We still love him, and he's still a good guy, but he's just got really funny beliefs. He's just, he's just often never, never, never land. Okay? That's, that's what my lot is right now. So we don't have any assembly that we, we do. I, will t I talk, teach my wife once in a while, and things that come up, and I'm going to teach her what you taught today and what you taught today. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Because I have a, a gentleman, a, a lovely, wonderful guy I know in, um, in, who lives in Texas. I visited him. We've talked about these same things. And he has questions. Well, what about those North Koreans? Those people in, in the jungles in South America, oh, they, they've never heard that Jesus Christ died for them. They've never heard of it. What's going to happen to them? Yes. And he's beginning to think. But my problem is, I, I use the dump truck approach when I talk to people sometimes. I try not to, but sometimes I do. They have some, it shows some interest. I back the dump truck up. Lift the gate up, <laughs> because I'm afraid I'm never going to get a chance to talk to him again. So I can give him as much as I can. That's right. Okay. So I, 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 I give him as much as I can. And, and so I'm dealing with this guy, and, and he's, a, he's an educated, intelligent man. But when we dealt with, we got to the... King James Bible, and that he dug his heels in. You are not moving me from this position. So I said oh, to myself, "All right, I'll use just the King James Bible and work with these, try to get these doctrines across in that." But he thinks I'm an apostate. But that's the way it is, and I'm sure I'm not. I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir here because. Most of you are in that same position. You have friends, relatives, whatever, that think you're... Okay? That's my journey so far. And I don't care if I don't ever have another church to associate with. I'd much rather know the truth and stand for that. Right. And, 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 I, and I, I haven't suffered. I, I really haven't suffered. But the truth, that's important. Mm -hmm. That's important. Yes. Thank you for listening to me. Mm -hmm. All right.